everyone. Well, our guest today is a very, very topical one. Gary Slutkin is the founder and chief executive of Cure Violence. Now, Gary started in a very different world. He was a physician and epidemiologist, he spent 10 years working in Africa, combating tuberculosis, cholera, AIDS. He was director of intervention for the World Health Organization. And then he came home to his native Chicago and saw what a problem crime and homicide particularly were in the United States. And he came to the conclusion that violence is like a disease. It spreads like a disease. He set up an NGO now called Cure Violence, which has achieved by treating violence as a disease, remarkable falls in violent crime in many places around the world, in neighborhoods in New York, Baltimore, Trinidad and Tobago, Honduras. And he's also still in his old business advising governments on COVID-19. Now I say he's a topical speaker. Within the last hour, Bill de Blasio, mayor of New York, uh, announced a big additional funding boost for cure violence, which is already very active in New York City. And de Blasio used the words, this is the future. In other words, this is a way to suppress crime, even get rid of murder in some places without the police. Gary has always believed that the police are not the best way to address crime. So it's topical for that reason, and it's topical for another. Gary is very alert to epidemic threats of violence, and he believes that the US now, with everything that you're seeing on television, could be at the start of a dangerous epidemic of violence. I won't say anything more than that for now. Gary, please welcome and take it away. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pamela and Simon, and uh, good morning, afternoon, and evening to everybody. And I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here today with you. Now I'm going to jump right into sh sharing the screen and showing some slides. And uh, hope that this works. Okay, it's not that. It would be this. All right, so um, we're going to talk today about how violence is like any other health epidemic, and in fact, the only health epidemic that isn't primarily managed by the health sector. And the essentials of this is showing that violence is a contagious disease and that treating it gets results. And that's what I'm gonna run through quickly. And then later, we're gonna get to the current situation, in particular of the US although it's relevant everywhere. So to start with, how do we show or think about violence as a contagious disease? Well, essentially it means that one event leads to another, which leads to another, which leads to another, and then we have an epidemic health problem and people are more um, familiar with this now under the um, reign of uh, another health epidemic that we're seeing, but we're saying that violence is similar and therefore you could take any of the individuals here on this chain and say that in fact, they've been infected by someone else and they could infect someone else. And therefore we would look at any single one of them as having acquired a health problem. And then therefore, if we were to look at someone who has done violence, not just someone who has had violence done to them, that we would see them as having primarily a health problem rather than whatever else it was that we might've thought before. In other words, we've misdiagnosed this issue. Most of the data and research um, as of a few years ago was, and this is still the best summary of this, in an Institute of Medicine report, National Research Council, on the contagion of violence. And I'm going to summarize it in our own findings of the science of violence as a contagious disease. Now, first, as for anything, there are reasons to say that it is, and that these are some of the reasons that I'm going to quickly go through. First, that there are criteria for a contagious disease, that there are definitions for both disease and contagious, that there's a biological basis or physiological basis, and then showing that treatment works. So what are the criteria? Well, there's essentially three. Let's see if this works. The clustering, the waves, and transmission. Let me just quickly show you these, and if you can check off all of these, you've met the criteria. The clustering, and this is one of the things that led me to come to the idea that this was an infectious disease. Here is 
an infectious disease that you all would agree upon, which is cholera. Here's the clustering. And here in Chicago is the clustering of violence. Why is it clustered? Because one event leads to another and they're close to each other. Next criteria, these standard epidemic waves that we're now getting more used to understanding too. You know, and here we're seeing secondary waves. And this is because epidemics all consist of multiple epidemics on top of each other, either in time and, or space. So you could see different parts of a country, different parts of a city, or just the um, epidemic control released as we're seeing now in COVID. And this is the epidemic curve of violence in the United States over 50 years, actually more than that. Here's an epidemic curve of cholera. This is a point source epidemic. Here's an epidemic curve of violence. Cholera, violence with secondary waves. Gary, then, let me just ask you, we understand how cholera spreads or COVID spreads. Can you give an example of how violence spreads from one person to another? Well, I'm going to go to that very quickly, really. But the, the essence of it is that our, it is exposure. And the exposure, unlike the exposure of you're breathing something in or swallowing something, is actually a visual brain exposure. And so people are doing or copying what they see other people doing. This is basically the essence of how behavior is largely formed. And then we continue to follow what other people are doing um, because we have brain mechanisms for wanting their approval and avoiding their disapproval. And this is, let me run, get, jump up to that point. Here's the definition of disease, characteristic signs and symptoms causing problems or death and of contagious just simply causing more of itself. So here's where what um, Simon is asking, how the heck does this happen? And we're just simply not used to thinking of contagious as through the eye and through the brain. We're used to, yeah, we can taste something, we can um, breathe in COVID or a flu or a cold, and then it gets replicated in our oral pharynx or in the gut. Here there's replication occurring in the brain and the exposure is basically seeing it or being around it. So I won't have details, nor do you want it now, but this has been written up and there's cortical copying centers. You've heard about these as mirror neurons. And yes, we are primarily copying organisms. And this explains what could be called senseless the walking or senseless violence is that we just haven't made sense of it. And all behavior, in fact, is contagious. This is not coincidence. This is not coincidence. This is not coincidence. We're doing what other people are doing. And there's circuits for this beyond copying, needing acknowledgement, recognition, status, and so on. But with violence, we jump off the cliff. Now, the-, the Gary, one can, of I those... just, can I just interrupt with one more question? Definitely, Pam. Uh, yeah, your, your point is not that um, violence is similar to an infectious disease, that it operates in the same way. It's that it actually literally is infect an infectious This is not a metaphor. I mean, it's only journalists saying this is a very good metaphor. No, it is precisely by definition a contagious disease. It's like saying, you know, is a whale a mammal? You know, it meets the criteria, it's warm blooded, it gives live birth, it suckles its young, tick, tick, tick. I didn't write those criteria. I didn't write the definitions. It just so happens to fit. It, it meets every single individual population criteria. And most importantly, it responds to it. And, it. and even additionally, it explains all kinds of things that weren't previously explained. Like why someone who was abused as a child would abuse his own child, which of course makes no sense because he knows how bad it is, yet he's managed to copy these series of behaviors unconsciously. And I just want to show here in that context that a lot of people believe it's due to conditions around them. This is, these are project, you know, this is a, a housing project with horrible poverty, schools horrible, fathers not around, but the kids didn't see violence. And the parents, when surveyed, didn't said the kids didn't see violence and they're not doing it. Same thing, worse conditions, you don't put COVID in there, flu doesn't come in there, AIDS doesn't come in there, it doesn't happen. Nevertheless, with high exposure, it happens and it's dose dependent, just like a cold, 
just like the flu, just like so many things. And this is the science, hundreds of studies now, Pam, on contagion. And this is so interesting, is that it isn't just community violence. It's family violence, suicide clusters, mass shootings have been shown to be contagious, hate crimes like anti-Semitism even, and war. All of these, and they lead to each other. People in war are more likely to do violence in their community, which also makes no sense because their community is not their enemy or against their spouse because they picked up this, in a way, infection. So what we need to get to next is, all right, does this theory, is it validated by practice? And then does the practice validate the theory? And so in fact, regularly, and this is probably stronger than anything that's been shown as regularly as this, is that 40 to 70% drops. And I'll show you the results and I'll show you how it works. And it basically works the same way as all health epidemics are managed. We've been doing this 20 years now, so I can show a map like this of places that we're working or have worked. Right now, highly focused in the US and Latin America because of the homicide rates here, and also because of the other stresses, and to a certain extent also because of COVID. These are places with uh, uh, substantial programs with Mexico and Honduras and Colombia with UNICEF, which is on this call, Mark. And then work we've done in um, the Middle East, in fact, trained 600 people in the middle of not just a shooting war, but a bombing war, and have been um, piloting this work in conflict zones and also in the, on the West Bank. So let's just look at the results a little bit, then get to how, and then come back to results, and then I'll stop and we'll um, take a, a small break on just slides. This column here shows, I mean, there's a number of studies that have been done over this time period of independently funded, independently performed evaluations. I mean, this right here at Chicago, this was a study of seven years of work with 10 years of baseline done by, with four different universities, four different methods, showing 100% drop in retaliations, time series and nails, all kinds of stuff. Um, this was, this is funded by the Justice Department. This is funded by the CDC with Hopkins doing it. And then, results abroad, Mexico, Honduras, into the 90% reductions with MS-13 and 18th Street. Trinidad, the, the most violent um, country in the Caribbean, also worked in prison situations, and it, the results are frequently very rapid. So how does it happen? The way that you stop any epidemic, you know, you might be thinking COVID, you have to stop the spread. You have to find out who might have it, either prevent that person from going to actually acute disease, which in this case would be doing a shooting. And then if there were an event that happened to prevent further spread, and then we'll talk about norms and this. And so what does it look like? I mean, so uh, this is what it looks like in terms of, you know, just a model. If you stop it, there's no more epidemic. But if it has already spread, for example, to here, then we got to go here. How is that done? Well, there's a system for this, just like there. And this is this very similar to the way TB or um, cholera or Ebola and many other things are managed. You have to map it out, find out who, where it is. In this case, you know what groups or gangs or subgroups are involved. Where are they? What you know? How do you reach them? And you have to find the people who can reach them. And in, for every epidemic, it's different people. For refugees, it's refugees. For AIDS, it might have been sex workers or other people in the community, and so on. Here, for violence in communities, it's people who used to be involved. And what are they doing? They're trying to find out what's going on and who are they? They're people. Let's look at the, the eyes of this fellow on the right. They know him. They already know him. He's credible. He can talk to them. They trust him. He can talk with them, them knowing that he's talking to them in their own interest. Carrie, he's just trained. to clarify so everyone understands, these people that you're showing are the violence interrupters, the people who yeah. go in and try to block the spread. These are violence interrupters. They're, this is a category of outreach worker or health worker all over the world. 
less so in America. There are health workers who are managing epidemics. And they go by different names in different epidemics. For AIDS, there's about six or eight different types now. Here we have outreach workers, interrupters, hospital responders, supervisors. There's a whole system. The interrupters are the cutting edge. They'll find out from their buddies who is upset, who someone slept with his girlfriend, who owes somebody money, who's thinking about it. These guys can say, hey, what's going on? And they say, it's none of your business. You know, get out of here. It's okay, okay, okay. They hear their complaints. They stay on top of it. They're trained in cooling them down, buying time. You might need, you know, let's, let's get something to eat. He doesn't mean it. You know, he'll, we'll get you the money. He's scared of you, he made a mistake. There's all kinds, they have a toolkit, just like an emergency medical technician has a toolkit for dealing with something they come on the scenes of that, you know, would be hard for some of us to deal with. They've managed, many of them have managed hundreds to thousands of these conflicts. And as you'll see, they're 100% effective at actually preventing violence, even when there's been a, a close murder in their family or among friends, because they have the way to shift the thinking. This is persuasion. This is undoing the contagion. So there's a science of the contagion, and there's a science of interruption and persuasion and behavior change and shifting norms as well. There's a film made about this, for those of you who haven't, so I think it live it streams on various, on Netflix and things like this. It shows it's their work. It's a wonderful work. film, wonderful. So um, we didn't make the film, we we're just subjects of it. And then we continued to work with these guys for six months to two years, as you frequently have to do with anybody who's changing behavior. And this is so critical to epidemic control. So we put a place marker here. Behavior is frequently all we have for managing epidemics. It's all we had from 1981 to 1995 for AIDS was changing behavior. It's all we had for Ebola was changing behavior. It's all we have had for COVID is changing behavior. Yet it works, but you have to know how to do it, which is basically finding the right people, giving them the right training, making sure they have the access, et cetera. These guys are behavior change agents, and we're doing stuff on COVID just like this. And then shifting the norms, you know, we've all shifted our norms. We've shifted our norms on drunk driving. I mean, we've shifted our norms on, I mean, uh, on smoking in um, convention, in um, meeting rooms. You know, I used to, we were smoking as, as medical students watching angiograms. And now we don't smoke in um, such uh, meeting rooms. In fact, we, now we don't even go to meeting rooms. So the, all the norms, the behaviors change as a group, and then it becomes unconscious. I grew up with norms that, in which I wouldn't do violence. So, and then you have a different way. You have the interruption and you have the norms, and then you don't have epidemic. You have a place where everyone's distancing and everyone's wearing masks. You have a, uh, a place where someone would say, what are you thinking about? How could you possibly do violence? Then you don't have an epidemic. So, here is just to go back again to what it looks like on charts, but this is a community that went from having, this was the, the largest epidemic um, single beat in a Chicago neighborhood, and it dropped to here. And then we doubled the number of workers and it's dropped to here. This is where it started. This is 20 years ago. The first time in the most violent neighborhood of Chicago, 67% drop in the first year, and the funder said, do it again. This is six neighborhoods with dozens of controls. There's eight neighborhoods with dozens of controls. This is a summary of eight. 100% drops in retaliation. This is someone else's evaluation of this work. And then you can see the retaliations or the spread blocked, stopped, reduced. This neighborhood ended up going 450 days without a shooting or killing. Those of you who know Baltimore and Cherry Hill, this is a notorious neighborhood. Trinidad, um, here's the control, and here's the, look at how quickly the drop. Gary, Gary, I have a question. How many, because you have to stay with, once you've done an intervention and an interruption, you have, uh, you have to stay with the people a long time to make sure that behavior change endures. How many, like in an, in an average size neighborhood, how many, people from your team do you need to have 
kind of out doing this work? Well, let me say a couple of things about that. I mean, it's frequently not an, an, enough as it should be. I mean, like that 67% drop was done with eight people in a neighborhood that was having 40 shootings and killings a year of 30 or 50,000 people or something like that. And now New York is really building this out right. I mean, they have over 200 workers and this is going to be doubled or tripled. Yeah, this is- You have to classic. realize this is a place where police, there are 35,000 or something like this, please. Just tell us something about New York because it comes in the middle of the wave of protests over George Floyd's killing. Uh, Mayor de Blasio seems to have made quite a big shift towards you. What happened today? Well, what I just heard about an hour before, and you know, where this is the context of the conversation that's going on in the United States right now about policing, is that um, we have an infrastructure. We, so the work is not really done by Cure Violence. It's done by Cure Violence partners. And these partners are trained and guided by Cure Violence. And um, what they've been doing is reducing violence, as I've showed you, in all kinds of situations, in all kinds of countries, in all kinds of cities, in all kinds of communities. Um, and then, um, and some places have picked this up and some haven't. So, but it's been, there's been pushback all along because the worldview is that this is a problem of bad people and that people deserve punishment. And punishment is the way to solve this. And we see now in the news quite clearly that there is racial elements to this and that policing exactly doesn't make things better. In fact, police are um, themselves affected by the epidemic of violence and they themselves have caught it. So what you need is health workers. So what, what New York has done very, very well, it's a progressive city, is um, keep this in their budget since 2009. And um, consistently, they've doubled it up. Now they've transformed it into COVID, public education, behavior change workers, because they have the access and the reach. And now they're also being um, correctly labeled as the solution to, to um, the core of how to reduce violence. Most of the social problems should be managed by communities. Most of the places in the world that are safe are not safe because of police. Most of the places in the world that are safe, they're safe because of norms and because the community has particular ways that they manage this. I have so many examples from places that I've lived of how the community manages its own problems. So all we've done, very simply, is use basic health and community approaches, made it structured and into a new system and replicated it, proven it. And now what um, Mayor de Blasio isn't the only, I mean, this is going on in New Orleans and Philadelphia and Kansas City to a, a smaller extent in Chicago, in um, Honduras and Mexico. And I mean, this is in a lot of places, but it's not been the paradigm because people have not been able to see this as an epidemic health problem. They've stayed in the moralistic frame of wanting to control people or punish them or teach them a lesson, whatever you want to think about. This is what, you know, when I came back to this country, I was astounded that people thought this was the solution, that policing was a solution. I mean, when I presented this data to, after four years, I went back to Geneva, to World Health, I presented the first four years or five years of data on, this is how we reduce violence. Their response to me was, of course, how else would you do it? So if, Gary, if you could just snap your fingers and decide how we change policing in America and to what extent we reduce it, what, what would you do? What would be the smartest move? We, well, this is what we've been <laughs> attempting to do all along. It's basically, they can't be the center of anything having to do with behavior in communities because communities are really formed by the behaviors of those around them. And this can be, and it behaves as an epidemic nature. So you have the, the, the center of violence reduction is, is health workers, violence interrupters and outreach workers. And um, policing are the backup to the backup to the backup. 
and and then you know and i mean i i don't need to go there too far i mean i i put two or three people in in jail when i ran the tuberculosis program because they were not responding but i let them out as soon as they were no longer a danger to the health or safety of the people but this was managed by the health sector the health sector and the community and when i what do i say by the the public health approach the public health approach means that community does it all epidemics are managed from the inside out so what that means is the community does it but they need to be guided and trained and you know set up the the actual system so um policing is um it's it's not the way that um, behaviors are formed. You can see the way they're formed. They're formed by copying and modeling and by behaviors of peers. It's not the way they're maintained. They're maintained by peers and it's not the way they're changed. They're changed by peers and by credible messengers. And that's uh, basically social psych 101. Gary, but it's not just that the police, in your view, don't help. They also spread violence. You alluded to this a moment ago they have sort of caught the contagion. Can you explain a little bit how that happens? Well, um, they're exposed. So what did we um, just go through among other things is that the probability of doing violence does relate to the um, amount of exposure that you have. They've been exposed a lot. So I'm not in the business of demonizing them although I think the system was set up for the wrong reasons, which historically, which we know. And it might be, you know, how, where recruitment is really, should be changed. Let me tell you this. I, I'm at an MIT um, neuroscience meeting. I'm sitting next to um, a detective from uh, London. She says to me, Gary, if, um, if we had to carry guns, most of us would not have um, signed up. So there's there's a there's a different mindset. So um, I don't know how else to answer. I mean, what what we're seeing in in police behavior in in reaction to um, things is violent behavior too much, and so the the exposure to people who have been exposed so much needs to be way less. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Gary, just look, you, we have to keep looking at this as an epidemic mm -hmm. that of which the cloud of epidemic violence is over the whole thing, community and community and police. And so don't expect that to be reversed by anything other than highly um, selected and recruited and trained health workers who are trained in cooling people down. Health workers, not arrest powers. If you have arrest powers, you're not going to hear about things. You're not going to be trusted. You're not going to be, even if you know that person, you know that he's, but if he has arrest powers, you're you're unlikely to say things. I mean, for example, you know, mom calls a violence interrupters because her kids are loading weapons in the basement. She's not going to call police on her kid. So the interrupters come, they cool things down, they swear at each other, the thing gets resolved. You know, this Gary, has someone to is asking. Someone is asking how who trains the interrupters and exactly how are they trained? Well, the um, we do the training. Cure Violence Global, our, our headquarters team, we have an extremely strong, extremely experienced team. Some have been doing this for 15 years. Um, we guide the communities themselves into the selection process. I mean, the selection is very important and it's, it's about credibility and access and trust, the desire to be helpful to other people and the ability to you know, be in the super, supervised situation. They're, um, Training is largely about, I would say, three th essential things. One is, um, you know, how to work in this system, you know, and, and uh, communicate, you know, in a work 
force like this, because a lot of people, and this was also true for cholera and Ebola and so on, you know, a lot of people who were recruiting haven't worked in structured ways. I mean, then the, the, the center of it is the re-understanding of this problem and what it means, what epidemic means, and that what it means, how important it is to stop an event from happening. And then of course the skills, the, um, the skills of how to approach, how to cool down, um, what not to do, how to buy time. Um, and it's very intensive. I mean, it's, hun it's hundreds of hours. It's 100 hours at the start and it's continuous training. We're in about our fifth or sixth um, manifestation or version of this training. We're always training and improving the skills of, of these workers. That's why they're, and then, you know, there's a monitoring system. This is public health. This is data. This is science. You have to show that it's working. You have to show that the epidemic is going down. And you need to show, and you, you're not actually aiming for anything less than getting rid of it. Gary, uh, someone's asking a question that I bet a lot of people have, which is, isn't gang violence a symptom of bad conditions? No money, no jobs, no way out. To what extent does it come from that? Yeah, that is one of the explanations. It turns out not to be true. Not, and that's what I, I, um, I don't know if the person who asked that, but I'm happy to return to that, saw that. So this, this essential study has been shown that um, in these very, very bad conditions where violence was not, the kids had not seen it by them being asked and by their parents being asked, and then following them prospectively, they're not more likely to do violence than the general public. And what about video games and simulated violence? Does that, is that can lead to actual violence? So the, the research on this is it's not a significant contributor. I mean, there are, there are people who study this who think that it is more than, than um, some people think. But generally, it, it shows that people are a little less empathetic. They might be less likely to help people. But I mean, if you look at Japan, they're all over video games, watching them very, very, very seriously violent video games all the time. But they're not, um, they don't have, um, homicide rates, or, you know, there's like, you know, I don't know if it's a hundredth less than America or what. Why? Because the context is different, and also the culture is different. So what is culture? Culture is, you know, if you think of a culture medium of bacteria or culture of, uh, you know, or a, a culture of people who are dressed in um, Scottish kilts or who are, you know, wearing masks or you know, culture is people are doing similar and thinking similar to each other. You know, the Eastern culture is different than Western culture. The norms are different. It's communal. It's in, in whereas in um, the Western culture, it's highly individualistic. I mean, so what, the violence does not exist in a vacuum, but it does exist within a highly individualistic, competitive, aggressive culture, which America is known for. I didn't make this up. I mean, you could, uh, when I was working at World Health, you know, and I had um, a number of um, Americans and people from other cultures, Europe, Africa, Asia, in the room. The difference between Americans and others in the room is very obvious. I mean, they um, are, <laughs> they'll do most of the talking. And they need to, I had to debrief them before um, coming into a meeting of an international group. So there, there's something in the culture, um, but to, of America that has been there a long time that people are beginning to see and blame on this or that or the other thing. Um, but so, but to your question about um, video games in particular, um, this is not a big part of this. Well, a big part of this is that this is contagious and it's contagious in the context of what your peers are doing. And it continues on its own as any contagious process if it is unmanaged or if it's managed wrong. Gary, I'm going to we, we've yeah. got a lot of questions coming in. I want to get to as many as possible. Uh, and I also know you have a couple of last slides to show, which are about the, the current moment. Before you get to those slides, a question from our friend Mike Feigelson. What would this look like if we scaled it up nationwide? How many violence interrupters would it take to replace the U.S. police? What would it look like as a huge nationwide program? It would be, be less than a percent of the cost of policing. Less than 1%, you're saying? Probably, yeah. 
we did these calculations. I don't want to be fully quoted on this. We haven't done these calculations for a long time. I presented these calculations to uh, OMB and to uh, the, the national government for the top 15 cities and, um, in, in 2009, actually. Why is and, it so uh, cheap, more or less? Is it because they're not, they don't have equipment, they're not getting big pensions? It's all salaries, really, yeah. of workers. Yeah. And um, essentially- so you a lot of money on this as well as everything else. Well, I mean, what do you have in, in um, you know, in, in Chicago, the police budget is uh, one to 1.2 billion and frequently a hundred million in um, not overtime, extra overtime. And Chicago has um, historically not had more than four or six million for this. And at one point when it had six million, the killings went down by 25%. Um, okay, Gary, you have a couple of slides that are talking about the US where it is now, I believe. Do you want to get to those? Yeah, should I share screen here or? Um... Yes, yeah, you can share your screen, yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to zip through the rest of this here, if I can. Right, so these are. Um, bef so basically, this means a whole new paradigm and a whole new language. I just really want to point this out there. We've been using the wrong words. We need a new language. And we're understanding it in this way instead of moralistically. All right, so let me get to where you're asking. Oh, this is relevant. This is the new system. This is the new system. By the way, I think um, there are some slides like this that where police are shown here on the periphery, although it doesn't seem to show here. When All you right. say this is the new system, this is actually in place in some, in some cities? Pieces of it, Pamela, pieces of it. The community organization, this is the structure. You know, a health department oversees it. Sometimes it's in the mayor's office, which is where it is in New York, although it's gone back and forth here. Same thing in Baltimore, it's gone back and forth. Then you have community organizations. This is the infrastructure. Then you have these outreach workers and the workers in a relationship to the hospitals. So if there's someone shot, the interrupters can come and make sure that there isn't a retaliation. And then there's interactions with the schools. Everybody knows their role. We've got papers on this, on this whole system that's been outlined. It's also on our website, cureviolence.org or cvg.org. The, the, the whole system has been outlined in all the roles. All right, so to, um, let's just talk about now what's going on and the focus will be America, although um, I think this is highly relevant to Latin America too, but let's just talk about the US right now. This is what's going on. We have a lot of epidemics going on. So COVID, um, which as you know, has killed 110,000 people in three months and has not really slowed down Um, violence already present, political divisions already present. The violence going up in communities in some relationship to this. Family violence and violence against uh, children has been going up everywhere everybody's looked since COVID. And suicides have been going up everywhere that um, anyone's looked. And uh, um, someone who's on the call here today told me about a call with uh, 10 countries in Latin America, and all of them were talking about suicides, every one of the 10 going up um, since this has started. Now in the US, we also have this situation of serious political divisions, is, which is, is not new. Um, police you violence see going on. political division as a type of ep epidemic, Gary? Yeah, and this is, um, These political divisions have been going up. This is a chart um, not made by us, by a political scientist, Peter Turchin, who has shown the risk situation of America that's been going up since the 70s. The, risk is based the, on, this red line is based on what? This red line is um, extra, um, this is like mass shootings, rage shootings, um, uh, the elites fighting with each other, and in economic inequality, 
These are all risks for um, what was done before Civil War, when this went up like this, and when this, which is well-being, which is um, jobs and salaries and health indices began to go down as they have been going down in America. So what I'm saying, and this all preceded the 2016 election. This in fact was published in 2016. And it's not just true for the US, this is historically, but it's also true for other countries in Europe and in Asia, historically that these indices predict serious problems. And so what I, I wanted to point out here is that all of these, so there's an epidemic nature to the division and the anger and the rage and the violence. And we're also seeing, you know, this new, this new, and all of these things have reactions to each other. And they, they feed each other. And, and, you know, not to mention this last point down here, which is also coming up and anyone from the outside. And I, sometimes I feel like I'm on the outside because I have this World Health, you know, come in out of a country and kind of do an assessment of it. Um, the likelihood of political or violence around or leading up to or after an election would not be considered small for, by political scientists. Now, I just want to add this thing is that all epidemics have associated epidemics. This is something, a, a, um, a slide I made just about COVID, because this is what you have found with AIDS. You know, epidemic fear is a different kind of fear. It's, it's really freaky and frightening. And um, blame and hate, I mean, for, with um, AIDS, it was um, the gay population in some places and others, it was other populations. You know, with, with every epidemic, there's someone to be blamed. You know, in the U.S., first it was the Chinese, now who knows. And uh, violence frequently accompanies misinformation, mischief always. People leave, you know, there's migration and economic and political instability. So all of this is predictable with an epidemic as serious as COVID. So what I'm, I'm pointing out here is that this is a problem set of overlapping epidemics that are almost inseparable. And, but, I, but here they are, misinformation, but they can be taken separately and together. They'll lead to each other. So what is the epidemic playbook? It's to see this in this way to start with, rather than trying to win. I mean, you can try to win your part of an election, but to, to, to fight against one side or another in some other ways is not the way violence is reduced. It's not the way, in fact, even misinformation is reduced, although there's ways to deal with it that we won't have time for. But this is the epidemic playbook, no matter what you got, is interruption by peers. Think about who the peers are. If the peers are police to police, if it's white groups to white, white people to white people, whatever it is, and using the infrastructures. And this is, you know, what we're what we at CVG have is we have infrastructures throughout the country and in the communities. We can reach some, but not all of the hardest to reach. And then it's all about behavior. Everything on that last chart is about behavior. And the, the good news about this is if we see this right, behavior change works. This is AIDS before drugs. In Uganda, this was an assignment I had a long time ago. This was the reduction in HIV in Uganda. This is cholera. Nothing, there's no drugs here, no drugs here. There's no um, vaccine here, there's no vaccine. Same thing for Ebola, same thing for the violence curves that, so that I've shown you, and the same thing for COVID. You know, this one is New Zealand, but it's also showed up in Japan and Vietnam. And it's even in this country where there's been enough behavior change, enough either lockdown or masks or whatever. So the management of COVID and these associated problems now needs to move to the thinking and, and the, um, in a way, the methods. Using the infrastructures, infrastructures for, for epidemic control are always used for the next epidemic. Too many examples. I had a switch from TB and all kinds of other things to cholera when it showed up when I was living in Somalia. The polio infrastructure helped push back Ebola. So this is the way that epidemics are managed. This is violence, epidemic in Chicago, infrastructure, health workers, behavior change. 
there's behavior change managing an epidemic. Gary, what about social media threats of violence, which of course are part of the whole problem at the moment? For example, neo-Nazi groups on social media, which I suppose could become real life violence. How would we think about handling those? So it's, a, it's a tough one. Um, we're interacting with, um, we've um, developed relationships with three um, individuals and groups who, who are watching that and who can understand that and are trying to figure out what um, works or, uh, and what isn't working. So it's a really important part of this. Um, we've been also interacting with this around the mass shooting, which is similar. So I don't have a simple answer for this, but um, the, you go back to the interruption, you go back to the epidemic control playbook, and you start with the, the need for detecting and interrupting potential events or things that could lead to it, how that's done preventing spread, how that's done through credible sources, shifting the norms. Now, shifting the norms has a lot of different angles on it, shifting perspectives, shifting the frame. And then the, the public education about what is happening, people need to understand transmission because then they know what to do. So we may even be in, in the realm of trying to shift the um, conversations around um, the emotional, aspects of what's being used. So it's, it's slightly different. Um, it's, 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 it's basically very similar to, um, you know, what the mass shooting realm of which there's a lot of warning signs that people didn't use or go to. So it, it needs to get set up. We had a question We're, about two things. Could you just give an example of how you would anticipate and prevent one? Well, there, um, there's words that are used and there's people conversation even in the newspapers to where people need to know who to call that um that would not make things worse and so um let me just make for an example of something that's there's so many of these too the pulse shooter the Pulse nightclub shooter. Yeah, so this person was followed by FBI for, I don't know, it was nine months and then a second time for six months for a year. And, but there was no intervention. They were just waiting for this person to do something. Because they couldn't do anything until he committed a crime. Nor, nor are they trained to. So it's like for us, it's like watching someone develop, you know, tuberculosis or AIDS or something like this without intervention. So, and that took 20 officers just for the watching. I mean, our workers each can help 20 to 40 people. So there, there's a lot of warning signs that show up to which the right interventions are not applied. That person should have had um, been able to be approached by someone who was um, accessible and credible um, to him and trained. Gary, when we listen to your case and look at the studies around it, it's so convincing. What has been the resist, and it's great news that de Blasio is gonna um, widely implement um, some of your policies, but some of, some of your structures, but what has been the resistance? What, is it the police? Are there unions? Is there political resistance? What, what's stopping this from just becoming uh, the, the norm all over the country? Well, you know, I. I been asking myself that question a lot, and uh, but I think the dominant um, issue is the worldview, the way of thinking. There's still a, a way of thinking that's that's moralistic rather than um, health based, or I hate to say it, scientific. So the the view of the person himself or herself is in a, uh, you know, there's a, a punitive mentality in the West, and in particular in the US, rather than a supportive, helpful mentality. 
for that's a very big part of it. And then, of course, there are um, persons and systems to which this is threatening. The Lost money is not a problem. The data is not a problem. The cost savings are not an issue. We've answered those questions certainly a thousand times. Gary, last question. You've said exposure to violence predicts violence. Now, people all over the U.S. have been watching violence on screen, largely committed by police in the last two weeks, occasionally committed by small groups of protesters. What is the effect of that on, you know, 320 million people? Well, in fact, um, I don't really know all the effects that will happen. I mean, for, for some, it's a lot of anger. Um, for me, I'll just tell you, it makes me sad. Um, but the, the real effects remain to be seen because there's going to be things spun about this. There's going to be misinformation. There, there already is. And there's going to be mischief. There already is. And there's going to be blame. So it's like, what's going to take, um, you know, what right now it's looking like there's a pushback against policing. Um, but there could be a pushback, um, another pushback, or another pushback, another reaction. So um, in terms of making people be more uh, violent, it's um, possibly, yeah, I, I, I mean, that's unlikely. Um, but, you know, protesting itself now, it becomes more an acceptable behavior. It's actually expected of people to do it. So that, um, but the system and um, uh, how the system is going to respond, you know, is going to depend a lot of, on the media narratives and how much we can counter um, basically mischief, misinformation, and all kinds of um, agendas. And that all needs to be thought of as, as epidemic realities that themselves need public education. It's not the damning of one side or another, really. It's the public education about what's going on. It's the um, behavior change that we can try to guide with media, with various figures, not all. And uh, the outreach and being clear on our goals. You know, just like anything that we do in strategy where we expect results, we need to be clear on our goals. I mean, let me just say this, the goals on a COVID are, have not been right on. Bending the curve is half time. You know, you need to get it down and get rid of it. I mean, opening up is not a goal for COVID that opens up for the virus. So what are the goals that we all have now? I think we've been distracted by conversations about China or WHO or whatever. We need to have goals of reducing violence in the right ways and keep and reducing COVID and really be speaking to those two goals and measuring them and showing that we're succeeding in them and not being distracted by other goals. And there, of course, there are other goals. I mean, like reducing, you know, racial um, abuse and harm, of course, which is in the realm of violence. So that, that's the way I see it. You know, I just, I come from this training of epidemic control, which is a subspecialty of public health, which is an invisible field. No one knows what public health does. And very few people even, within public health have experience in epidemic control. But this is what we really need to do, is to transfer this set of problems into epidemic control. Do the public education, use our infrastructures, build our infrastructures, and, and, get, and get clear on where we wanna go. And also, you know, the worldview stuff, Pam, that you asked for, we really need to develop a different view and um, aspiration for the country if we're talking about the US right now, but also for the world, of course. Gary, unfortunately, we're gonna have to wrap this up. We have uh, a million more questions we all wanna ask you. I wanna let everyone know that Gary's website is cvg.org or cureviolence.org. Um, they take donations, so if you're looking for a good cause, I think this is definitely one. 
Um, Gary, uh, Simon and I just really want to thank you so much for being here today and giving us this profound paradigm shift, which at this moment is extremely useful. Um, Simon, I don't know if you want to say anything. Uh, I've been blown away by what Gary told me so much so that my column in the Financial Times tomorrow is about him, which uh, hasn't happened yet in the history of Pandemonium U. So <laughs> thanks, Gary. It was also when we approached it, we didn't know how topical this was going to be. Um, we would encourage everyone, uh, in addition to going to cbg.org, um, to please sign up for our newsletter. <laughs> Send us an email if you're not on the list. It's pandemoniumu2021 at gmail.com. Uh, as I mentioned at the start, we have great classes coming up. Friday, French, American, French versus American food rules, misunderstandings at the table, a slightly lighter topic than today. Um, and then uh, Friday, a week from uh, Friday week, let's talk about women and race in France with the activist and writer Rokaya Diallo and the journalist and author Lindsay Tremuda. We hope you'll all come back and join us for that. Uh, we have a tradition at the end of every PANU class that we unmute all and we give our speaker a round of applause from around the world. So I hope you'll join us in doing that right now. <laughs>